Well, it's my very great pleasure to introduce the Mavis, Mavis Robertson Plenary. Uh, many of you uh, will have known Mavis for very many years and will remember her fondly. For those of you who don't know, Mavis passed away in 2015 at the age of 84. She was one of the leading pioneers of the industry fund movement and the founding member of many of the collective vehicles that sprang from that movement. Uh, many of the successful initiatives that were born out of the profit to member sector are a direct result of her vision and her passion. Um, they are just words on a page and for many of you, you will hold in her heart, the me your, your heart, the memory of the extraordinary things she did, the sense of activism and purpose that she brought, I guess, from her days in the uh, peace movement initially, and her sense that she could put her shoulder to the wheel with other people of goodwill and make a better world. And I think that really is very empowering at a time when often young people feel they cannot make a difference uh, in their lives and the lives of a broader society. I think her life is a reminder that you very much can. Uh, before she died, she was involved in commissioning a new book on the history of the industry fund movement. It's called Workers' Capital. So to, to just give you a, a, a brief insight though into, into the, the work, which has been several years in the making really, um, I can probably can't really improve on the, the foreword that I wrote for the book to give you some sort of insight into what, what, what it's about. The $50 billion that comprised the superannuation sector in the, uh, of the early 1980s has grown beyond 2.1 trillion today, a number that eclipses uh, both Australia's GDP and the entire market capitalisation of all the companies listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. This is a fascinating uh, discussion. We're going to have the power of the collective, what's next for profit to member funds. It might be an idea to spend a little bit of time at the beginning of this session just talking about um, what is meant by the collective, what collective action has um, brought, and then we're sort of going to debate the culture uh, of the collective and how relevant it is today. We can start this, uh, any member of the panel can jump in at any time, but just, just so we don't assume uh, too much. What do, if we look back before we look forward, Gary, what do we note about uh, what the collective has brought beyond the uh, great social reform of superannuation in Australia? What sort of collective vehicles have come out of the movement? Uh, well, there's been this, this forum, AIST, the, 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 the Conference of Major Super Funds, is one of the quite early ones. Uh, it, 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 CMSF, came about because at, at the time, um, the structure of ASPA, and it's changed a lot since then, but the structure of ASPA at the time was such that it really was completely dominated by service providers. There was virtually no, no members really represented there at all, with a few public sector funds, but mainly service providers. And so that was one very early example of that. But lots of organisations have sprung up. You know, the, the one most closely, uh, most closely associated with is the industry fund services and the various offshoots of that leading right through to IFM investors today. So AXI, obviously, in the corporate governance space, another one closely mm -hmm. associated, associated, by the way, with an initiative of Mavis Robertson. Women in super. Women in super. And women, women in super, of course. Words like collegiate, consensual, cooperative, collaborative. Um, how would you articulate that sort of uh, culture, Catherine? Why is that meaningful today? Um, I think uh, collaboration is, is as important now as it was then. Um, we, as an industry, need to sort of push forward and look what we can collectively do together um, to continue the great gains that we've made in the past. So I think what really underpins us as industry funds is that culture of collaboration and our values. And, and we're seeing it happening. Um, I think some on the panel might say, well, how could we do it more and where should we push into the new the new frontiers, but I think it's essential, it's part of our DNA. One serious omission, by the way, if I was might. that? A serious omission from that oh, list yes, before of was, it, was ME Bank, because... Yes, I was going to say. Interestingly, it, it was originally an initiative directly of, of uh, the ACTU with, uh, with National Mutual Lending, which formed Supermember Home Loans. And it's important because of the... to get a handle on the motivation of, of the movement. In the, in the 90s, as many people will remember, or some people will remember, the margins on home lending were massive. I mean, were truly mm. huge, mm. The, the margins, so the interest rates people had to pay. And so Super Members Home Loans was formed to come in and really undercut that market. David, if we can turn to you, um, 
you've got this concern that the collective seems to have unlearned how to do things collectively. What do you mean by that? Well, I think um, if you look at the debate around sales commissions, for example, we had uh, not only uh, for 25 years did we have this incredible campaign to get sales commissions out of compulsory super and, and, and eventually out of financial advice entirely, but for 25 years, I think almost without exception, no industry super fund, no not-for-profit fund paid a commission to a financial advisor right. in an environment where that was the prevailing model of distribution. All of the funds not only campaigned for something but stood right behind it as well. Uh, I wonder whether or not we would have that discipline now. Somehow the funds have to steel themselves to preserve the essential culture. Now, culture's only be, it's been in our DNA from day one. It's now, everyone talks about it, they write it up in the Harvard Business Magazine. But we've always known that culture is what has made the difference. But we've got to preserve it, you know, because we are part of a big financial services sector. We're there for the betterment of our members. Now, that might even go so far <coughs> as having to make an investment decision around a company that is using slave labour in their supply chain mm. or child labour. They might be giving us great returns. It might be Domino's pizzas, which is a really topical issue. You know, we're underpaying people. Is that a good business model that we should be investing in? And um, we saw on TV just recently on 7.30 report the whole aero care, awful situation in our airports where people are... Oh being treated abominably um, by that company. And yet I know a lot of people in this room would have investments with Archer, that is the parent company. So as an investor, people running our investments, I would expect that we would be looking at these things as part of our culture. Do we really want to be part of a company that treats their workers like that? You know, 69% of the public believe that industry super funds will ensure the system will work in their interest. 38% uh, believe the government will do that and 31% believe the banks will do that. It's the reason why we've got that trust, and I don't think that industry funds are immune to the, the general mistrust and cynicism about institutions, but the reasons why we're much better placed is because we have been deliberately different. And the, I think the implications for us uh, into the future are, it was, well, how do you maintain that trust? What's the expectation of the public? Uh, research we've done shows that 70, I think 70 or 75% of the public want compulsory super to be not for profit. They want the system to be not for profit, and yet, um, you know, I think ISA has normally been not being backward and coming forward with our policy positions. We've never got as far as having a platform that says compulsory super or superannuation should be run on a not for profit basis. The public's there already. I think the key thing ought to be that chronic underperformers ought to be assisted out of the industry. If they're chronic underperformers, retail that, or industry. That means, yeah, whatever they are. If in terms of net benefit, to the members over appropriate rolling medium long-term periods. If they're chronically underperforming and the marketplace and it does, is not sufficient to terminate them, then they may, by regulatory assistance, be helped to m remove themselves from the industry. 94% of all the assets held by the bank-owned super funds over the past 10 years have, are, are, in, are uh, performing under the median. So, Gary, to take your point, pretty much, in fact, the reality is that if your money's with a bank and super fund, your return uh, will be below the median return for the super sector. There's a question on the screen. Is the next challenge universal aged care? What a great question. Catherine, do you want to take that one? <laughs> oh, I think that's a very uh, difficult um, a question to answer, thinking that one through. Um, yes. It is a challenge. We do need to do something about it. There have been models put out there about extending insurance um, and having a sort of a group insurance scheme. Um, absolutely, it is a challenge, as is income in retirement is a challenge. We've focused on accumulation phase for a really long time. We're now focusing on income in retirement. Um, these are part of the challenges. Look, I think... Um the, the cradle to grave offering I think that industry funds want to offer um, does include aged care at the end of, end of the day and uh, particularly the financial aspects of it. Uh, and some innovation has been done around you know, income and retirement. So an industry fund, a CEO of an industry fund has led the thinking on this and over the last year or so they've put together a new model that models you know, on about five or six different mm. factors yeah. what members would need in retirement, and that can be used by trustees, because at the moment we mostly model our 
income and retirement on age based sort of assumptions. Mm. I just came from a session before, unfortunately I didn't get to see the end, but on rising inequality mm. and how that is an issue economically, socially, um, globally. And there was a great question on there before, Alan, that seems to have dropped off now about the gig economy yes. and the impact the gig economy and, is and having. And there, there was a question about that. How do you, how do you uh, engage with membership if there's a gig economy? There's another question here. Our collective responsibility surely needs to be dignified retirement for all workers. Correct. Women will retire Absolutely. with less than half and solutions now won't close the gap for young working women. What are we waiting yeah, for? Yeah, and this is exactly what I was going to say. The whole concept of universality, which is what Mavis and everybody set out to actually deal with in the very beginning, will crumble before our eyes with the gig economy. I read an article this morning in the paper about um, a guy who was a courier and he'd been driving around, riding around in sub-zero temperatures, you know, for eight hours. He's an independent contractor. They don't pay him super. He doesn't get leave. He doesn't get sick leave, you know, none of the things that you get as being an employee. He's got one boss, he does one job all day. He'd been out in the cold sub-zero temperatures and said, I can't do another job. So he doesn't get any more work. Mm. For all of the courage that, the, that you know, Paul Keating in particular, but the Labor Party showed in introducing compulsory super, uh, the government still at that time failed a courage test around the issue of short-term work. Everyone who receives a wage, everyone who, and whatever um, their employment status, gets their super. And technology should assist us in ensuring that occurs. Funds are vulnerable to the digital age where I watched uh, a niece sit on the lounge uh, a couple of weekends ago and move from one bank to another in 20 minutes using their iPad uh, and looking for the best deal. Just at the end of the day, super is not just about delivering people uh, as the best retirement we possibly can. There's also the implications of you know, reducing uh, the liabilities for future generations of taxpayers. Yeah. And that's why I think we have to be careful saying, and, and oldies like myself saying, we know what's best for you. We know how good your life's going to be when you're 65, you know. I can tell you, with four children and now grandchildren, they're not going to be too impressed with that, mm. you know. So I think... Whereas I've got a fridge magnet that says, leave home now while you know everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. that's it, that's it. <laughs> Nobody's <laughs> taking me up on the offer.